Welcome to The Economy Magazine. I'm Benjamin Chong Alfares. All eyes are on Israel, at least so Israelis may think, as citizens cast their vote. While the actual result of the elections may remain unclear for some time to come, if we're to believe the polls, the issues are painfully clear to voters and politicians alike. With us in the studio to discuss Israeli voters' main economics concerns are Jack Smith, a partner at Gornitsky & Co., one of Israel's leading law firms, Aaron Pelek, partner and chief investment officer at investment management firm Clary Capital, and I-24 News journalist Daniel Roth. Let's first take a look at the main issue facing Israelis, the unbearable cost of living. The high cost of living, a social problem which caused thousands to go out into the streets of Israel in 2011, is still a major issue to be discussed in the wake of the upcoming elections. The issue became symbolized by the high cost of milky in Israel, where it is a national treat, compared to Germany, a country where young Israelis are moving to find lower living costs. 47% of Israelis are not satisfied with the current economic situation, according to a government survey. The discussion surrounding this major domestic issue has been at the forefront of the populace's mind. But current Prime Minister Netanyahu is criticized for focusing too much on national security and downplaying the economic situation. Meanwhile, voters are saying Yair Lapid has failed to bring any change after being elected as finance minister for his promises of reform. High consumer costs and import taxes combined with a decline in gross salaries makes the cost of living a hot topic. Only the election results will show how it plays out in the end. Mr. Palak, why is the cost of living in Israel so high? In a uh, nutshell. Yeah, <laughs> lack of competition. Lack of cartels? Yeah, I mean, it's mon whether it's monopolies in certain areas, cartels, all the, you know, lack of competition, whether it's in bank many, many different sectors. Some of them are state-owned uh, areas where the state controls, whether it's water, electricity. Others are, you know, private sectors, such as, you know, banking, food, cars. So wherever you look, in many, many different areas, there's just not enough competition to bring prices down. Is the government responsible for this, Daniel? I think it depends on, uh, on the sector, actually. Uh, when you look at a sector like cell phones, uh, Moshe Kahlon of the Kulanu Party, who's running, uh, uh, brought in competition and the prices shot down enormously. Right. On the other hand, all research shows that when you uh, open up the market and privatize water systems, uh, oftentimes the price goes up because it's not it's something people don't have a choice about. So a lot of times it depends on whether it's a utility, something people absolutely need, or if it's something that people, mm -hmm. uh, a technology or something uh, that people can can uh, do without theoretically. Right. Even if if we don't, theoretically you can do it without of it. <laughs> what do you expect from a new government? I mean, do we see change happening following the elections? Well, I think if we do see any change, it will be slow and it will be difficult. Obviously, it depends on which government is elected and who's the minister of finance and who's the prime minister and to what extent the prime minister is backing the minister of finance um, in taking action um, in this area. But it's definitely very difficult because whoever is trying to uh, to increase competition within the market you know, needs, first of all, a lot of courage, but also because mainly because you know he'll, he or she will be fighting very significant, whether it's political or economic right. forces. Mr. Smith, what is your opinion on this? Do you see change happening following these elections? Well, I think yeah, this is one of the main issues driving the public opinion today. And I think there was an interesting article in the paper yesterday which shows, you know, we're in a deflationary uh, economy now, so that mm. means that the prices are actually going down in most sectors. But the article pointed out that where prices went up was real estate and public transport. And again, these are areas which are, co which are controlled by the government. And I think that the government, the new government, would be able to have a lot of influence with the right planning to, to, to bring prices down in these sectors. And it presumably depends on what kind of government we have, whether or not there will be a... Uh pressure, any pressure for that matter, on the cartels, is that so? Or is it basically something that is shared by all of the different uh, parties out there? Well, I think, I think that uh, we're going to see similar trends no matter who's in charge. There's not a lot of room 
uh, for, for veering too far to the left or too far to the right uh, into on economic issues. Uh, so I think we're going to see slow, as we've been seeing in much of the Western world, slow, slow processes of privatization okay. that, uh, that, that will sort of continue no matter if the slight left or slight right, right. takes it. Well, let's look at a, a different topic here now that is actually also very central to the whole uh, uh, situation here in economics in Israel. Um, Israel has long been praised for its ability to innovate for lack of natural resources. The discovery of more than 900 billion cubic meters of natural gas has changed that reality. But how much of this find should go to the people? Upon the discovery of trillions of cubic feet of natural gas off Israel's coast in the Mediterranean waters, the country's energy fortunes seemed poised for a major shift. Not only can these deposits cover much of Israel's internal energy needs, but a $15 billion deal to cover 15 years of gas to Jordan and potential talks with Egypt make export a major factor. But late last year, Israeli antitrust commissioner David Gilo announced that the majority control that American Noble Energy and Israeli Delic Group have enjoyed over the enormous Tamar and Leviathan gas fields would be broken up. Business interests have suggested that the move to regulate after the fact could leave Israel seeming unattractive to investors. Nevertheless, the move is intended to create competition in Israel's new and growing gas market. Meanwhile, the more recent discovery of the Roy field with over 3 trillion cubic feet of gas, according to the Haaretz report, could be a sign of more to come. But the big question Israelis are asking is whether or not these major deposits will mean a boon for the public at large or not. Mr. Smith, you focus on energy, on the energy sector at Gornitsky. Um, what is your involvement in the Israeli sector in terms of the natural gas find? Well, we're very much involved in the upstream development um, in the Leviathan field. Um, and I think um, one of the biggest fallacies that has uh, infiltrated into public opinion is that um, the public is not getting its fair share of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the gas fines. The interest of the public is clearly it's a fiscal interest. They get over 60 percent of the tax revenue. Um, and the public owns almost half the stock of Delic, of Nair, and Ratio, which have uh, the significant owners of the fields. So the, the, the interest of the public is actually uh, taken care of through the fiscal side of, of the gas revenue. So you would say it's not um, dangerous, so to speak, that a few uh, companies hold essentially this, this natural resource? Well, I think this is no longer an issue because the outgoing administration uh, has tabled the proposal which basically is going to force the Delic Group to sell mm -hmm. their interest in Tamar. So they will be out of Tamar and they will be only holding the Levi Leviathan field and the only company that will have a cross in uh, ownership interest will be Noble Energy. They are the operator of the fields. That means they're the technical company that professionally operates the field. And I think the government can find clever solutions how to manage their interests in both fields. Okay, so what should the role of the antitrust authority be in this kind of a situation? Well, I think the antitrust authority uh, basically, um, in their decision, they, they caused tremendous amount of damage to the development of the field. They delayed the development for a year. That means the revenue of the public was postponed for a year. Uh, and I think uh, basically, the solution they put on the table, basically I think the parties, the, the, uh, the parties involved are going to, to coalesce around that solution and, uh, and agreeing and, and, and proceed to the development of the Viathan field. Daniel, I believe that you have a very different opinion on the situation. Can you clarify? Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think that uh, it's not necessarily a fallacy that, that the public's not getting their fair share. There's a, there's a wide, wide uh, uh, breadth of the public that feels this way, that feels that that uh, this is a huge fine. We're talking, uh, like like it was said in the report, trillions of cubic feet of natural gas. That the public is is feeling f from the subject before the cost of living going up and not finding any sort of immediate relief. Uh, certainly not immediate. Maybe down the road. Maybe the suggestion that that uh, it takes time to spur this into the public purse well, I mean, makes sense. Energy it's costs have gone up tremendously as well. I mean, is that perhaps one of the reasons why people are concerned about this? Well, I what think, would you say? I think clearly, I mean, part of the discussion has moved from away from, um, okay, what, what should be the royalties or what should be the public share with, you know, within the revenues of these companies uh, to, you know, what should 
you know, natural gas prices be, which are, are the gas prices that are now now being supplied into the Israeli economy and feeding through into, you know, mm -hmm. companies, businesses, and so forth. And there, I think, at the moment, at least, the perception is, and it's more, I think it's more than a perception, because uh, people say this is backed by, uh, you know, information from, uh, you know, from, from around the world, that prices are, are, are currently high in Israel relative to what they should be. And the question is, how do you get those prices, which seem to be high, I'm not an expert on energy, but seem to be high, um, to a level which is more suitable or appropriate for you know where natural gas is right. trading typically right. um, around the world. Well, it'll yeah. be interesting to see actually how this plays out. But I want to go to the main story, so to speak, of the elections in terms of the discussions, which is, of course, the housing market. Um, it's been central to much of the campaign and housing crisis, which could point to a much larger problem ahead as some speak of a property bubble and a mortgage crisis could also be waiting to explode. Let's see more in this report. Housing costs have skyrocketed in recent years in Israel. It takes 147 months of average salaries to buy an average priced home as of the end of 2013, according to the housing ministry a rising figure as housing prices rose 80 percent between 2007 and 2014. Though the outgoing government has reported home shortages of between 100 and 150,000, the Bank of Israel suggests that number is lower according to Israeli Daily Haaretz, which reports that at the end of the third quarter of last year, 27,000 houses remained unsold, the highest number since 2000. Further, the supply of homes has gone up 83 percent over the last five years. It is unclear, according to the report, if supplies are indeed short or if high demand is the root cause, but housing costs continue to go up nonetheless. And while it's Israel's poorest communities, Palestinian citizens of Israel and ultra-Orthodox that primarily suffer, it is a pressure that nearly all Israelis feel. Real estate in Israel is another sector marked by and marking the growing economic inequality across the country. Mr. Palak, does the current real estate situation in Israel pose a threat to the future of the country? So I think, I think uh, yes. Uh, Why? Probably not for the reasons that you're thinking about. I mean, yes, I mean, it is a risk. High prices and a potential collapse pose a risk to the financial system in Israel. But, you know, but besides that, there are other issues which I think are at stake here. A, I think there's a social issue here, and, you know, the, the issue is causing social, increasing social tensions within, within society in Israel, and that's, I think, a threat to the st stability of society. And beyond that, I think that high prices are, you know, and this is a longer-term economic threat, are driving out, you know, many young people from Israel, talented people that otherwise would have uh, contributed to, uh, to the economy here and economic development. So for all these reasons, I think the answer is yes. Mr. Smith, would you say that there is a property bubble in Israel? Well, I think, yeah, because, um, because the, uh, the outgoing government wasn't able to decide on what would be the, um, the, the policy to bring down the pricing. So there was kind of a, a freeze in the market. There weren't any transactions. And now, um, in anticipation of, of, of the new policy, uh, prices have gone up. And um, until new policy is in place, the price is going to keep on going up and up because people want to be able to sell as high as they can in a high market. What needs to be done to solve the situation? Uh, I, I think our two guests uh, pinpointed something very, very important that, was, that uh, remains unsaid so far, which is that it's all of these intersections of all the things. It's, it's also moral concerns, but it's also the stability of the economy, and it's also sort of strategic thinking about how a government plans economic uh, realities. Uh, all of these pieces have to come together. There isn't a clear plan for housing. Nobody it's not has an easy a fix either. I mean, it's not just that you know you. you, are, you I, think, I think there are things that can be done, and the government yeah. ha you know, can do quite a lot. I think you know the, the government controls most of the uh, supply of land in Israel. They can do something on that side. I, which is know, cited so as one of the, which, one which of the is, most important. Which is problems. one of the things. But the people are already invested with mortgages, but ninety percent of which are unchangeable interest rates. Mm -hmm. Once interest rates go up, I mean, what happens? It, it, nothing you can do at this point is going to necessarily make that a better situation. Is um, it? From that perspective, I agree. I mean, uh, it's it's much more difficult. You have to deal with the um, with the current uh, risks that are out there. But to I make the situation better for those who haven't bought a house yeah. yet, so to speak, you're saying, let the government make land more available. Yeah. 
It's not um, just that. I mean, there are other things. Taxes, for example. Today, you know, investing in real estate in Israel has clear advantages relative to investing in others, you know, in, which in, is why in capital markets more investors broadly. Investors are about 29% yes, of people exactly, who Yes, exactly, exactly. So just taxes. kind of, just fixing that and bringing that to a more uh, kind of uh, equal level with other uh, types of investments can, you know, help stop the flow to some extent or slow them uh, going into real estate. Okay. So last comment, Daniel. Yeah, I, I think it's just uh, vital to understand this as a multifaceted problem that involves taxes, land prices, uh, all, all across the board, reform needs to be made. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Daniel Roth, of course, from i for News, Jack Smith from Gorninsky, and Aaron Pelley from Connery Capital. Thanks very much, gentlemen, for joining us. The elections episode, thank you very much for watching. I'm Benjamin Chandler Fares. Follow me on Twitter at Channel Fires, send us your comments, and join us again tomorrow for more on the elections. <laughs>